Welcome to the future of capitalism in uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger. We're going to talk um, about renewing the welfare state tonight. We have some um, amazing guests from over, all over the world uh, to discuss a basic income, uh, a job guarantee, basic services. Um, my name is uh, Thomas Bollen. I'm not David Overbeek, who was supposed to be here, but had some COVID-related related problems, so I'm a substitute. Um, I'm, f I'm a financial uh, journalist, writing mostly for a platform Follow the Money. Um, and I was invited by Sam de Munch from Think Tank of Young Economists, who uh, wrote a report about renewing the welfare state. And this was a, a, a project a part of the Future Markets Consultation. Uh, it's a group of young economists who are um, uh, uh, writing reports about how we can improve our economy. And uh, it's um, uh, led by Professor Govert Buys and our former Prime Minister Jan-Peter Balkenende. So we've got some big names on board <laughs> who are uh, supporting um, what uh, some and the think tank have written. Um, and they're also part of our new economy and sponsored by Sustainable Finance Lab um, and founded by the Goldsmithing Foundation and Templeton World Charity Foundation. So that was my list. Uh, this is all the people who are involved. And now we're going to start with uh, Sam de Munch, who's going to give a presentation um, of, of uh, the differences between basic income a job guarantee, a basic services, and he's going to give the presentation in the in the room next to where I'm seated. So, Sam, let's start. Yes, thanks. Also, thanks for this opening uh, and for being here uh, last minute. Um, yes, I'm going to uh, shortly give a presentation uh, about the different ideas, but I'm not going to defend any one of them, but I'm more going to make a more abstract point, which will... Uh, very much come later. But shortly, a really short overview of the history. So where did we come from? The, his, the welfare state, so the, how we organize to ensure the well-being of our citizens, has quite a long history. Here are just some terms you can see. So in the 19th century, we basically didn't have much of a welfare state. The state was not there for you. If you were in problems, you had to do it yourself. A bit maybe a bit too, too, too much of a short, simple statement, but that's roughly the idea. Then slowly, the social de de democracy came up and a more of a welfare state developed. Uh, and later on, since the 70s and 80s, we sort of made uh, the welfare state, we weakened it again. And the question is now, where do we go from here? My point today is that if we think about all these proposals, whether it's basic income, a job guarantee, or universal basic services, is that we always have to think about these three aspects. What do we do in terms of job policy, in terms of income, and in terms of services? Because also if you say we don't do anything, that's a choice. Not doing something is in this case also something. So what are the options? Very shortly, I'm not gonna discuss, discuss all of them extensively because I would need more than one evening. Um, but very shortly, if you want to stimulate jobs so that people can have a job, which pretty much all politicians always say they do, uh, there are a few options. You can stimulate demand, make sure there is enough money in the system and enough uh, yeah, people who want services or products. You can, as government, spend your money, and this is often associated with Keynesian policy. Then. The supply side, making incentives for companies, making it cheaper for them to hire workers, for example, is another option. And tonight, I think more important, the job guarantee, which is the idea that you actually give a job to everyone who wants to work. So instead of having people being unemployed and unable to get a job, as government, you provide them with a job at the minimum wage, often is the argument, and you can just make sure that everyone who wants can work. More on that later, but for now, that's it on jobs. Another category with a lot of ideas, what can you do in terms of giving people income, making sure they have enough money to spend on their basic needs? The most famous is, I guess, the unemployment benefits. If you are unemployed, you get some money so that you don't starve, but you can actually live and then search for a new job or, uh, yeah, 
Another famous, famous idea, and I guess most people tonight do know that idea, the basic income. So everyone gets often a monthly income from the state. Uh, and there are, of course, different variations of this. You can also have the variations of a ne negative income tax. But for tonight, I will keep it simple. Other ideas related to this are the participation income, in which not everyone gets a income, but only if you participate in the economy, which means that you can do some unpaid work or some paid work, you have to contribute to society, then you get an income. Another idea, a basic dividend. So we all, as society, collectively, for example, own, in Norway, for example, we own oil, and everyone in society gets a dividend of this. Often this is less than a full monthly income, so that's also a difference between basic income. And finally, universal inheritance. Also Piketty famously advocated this uh, for this, so that everyone who becomes, for example, 21 or 25, gets an inheritance so that everyone has sort of a jump start. All different ideas of giving people income or money. Lastly, basic services, making sure people have access to f either for free or accessible to basic services in life. So whether it's healthcare, we've seen this year how important this is, but also education and their ideas to expand this, also to include childcare, housing, public transport, and digital information increasingly becoming important, as it is also tonight, of course. All these different ideas, and the question, of course, is, is what combination of them should we go for? In terms of jobs, what do we want? In terms of income, what do we want? And in terms of services, what do we want? So, going back a bit to the history we talked earlier about, what did we do in the past? Now, as I said, it's sort of ideal type, so it's sort of the stereotypical laissez-faire liberalism doesn't do anything. You are on your own, so they say. So there is not really a job program, there is no income support if you're unemployed, and there is no such thing as universal health care, for example. Then, slowly on at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, this, the welfare state in a more social democratic form emerged. Full employment. The goal was to give everyone a job. And how did we do that? Main, mainly by demand side policy, stimulating the economy so that there would be enough economic activity so that people could work in the private sector. On the terms of income, there were benefits as rights. So if you were unemployed, you were able to get an income. In terms of services, we got healthcare and education. Then, since the 70s and 80s, this changed in terms of job. We said no longer that the goal was really to have everyone being employed because the idea of a natural rate of unemployment became very dominant and we became more focused on the supply side. In terms of income, the benefits became also less generous, more means tested, which means that if you, have, for example, have some assets, you first need to really, really show that you have no other income or assets to rely on and only then we'll give you this. And there is very much also associated act activation, so to really push people into finding a job. In terms of services, there were also a lot of budget cuts, privatization, to really make it more of a private market rather than public services. And now we are in 2020 or 2021 already, and the question is, where do we go from here? And there are a lot of proposals out, out there, and a lot of them really are famous because of one big ID. And this is, of course, how we really spread ideas in the world. You have one big ID, and that catches on and speaks to people. But my argument is tonight that we, while that is really important, we also have to think a bit more complex about what combination of the jobs, of the income, and the services we want, and what these proposals are really saying. So we'll go to these three, the proposal for a job guarantee, the proposal for universal basic services, and the proposal for basic income. I'll shortly take a bit of a sip. All right, and there we go. So, the job guarantee. <coughs> Sorry. As said, the idea is that everyone who wants a job will be able to get a job. The government can <coughs> sorry, provide this or at least facilitate this so that the, the non-profit non sector, for example, can provide these jobs. So in terms of jobs, it's very clear, a job guarantee. In terms of income, 
they argue that this will make uh, less people making use of benefits. So if you provide people the opportunity to get a job through the job guarantee, less people will take unemployment benefits. In terms of services, they advocate that they should be there. So for healthcare and for education. This combination then is sort of what the proposal often entails. If we go to universal basic services, the core idea is to extend these services from education and healthcare, which in a lot of countries are being guaranteed as public services, although not all, uh, but to extend this also to include other things, as I earlier mentioned, like housing, public transport, digital information, and childcare. So in terms of services, public services, extending them. In terms of job, they go back often in, in what they advocate for a bit more to the Keynesian approach of stimulating demand through fiscal policy. In terms of income, you have the benefits as rights. So if you're unemployed, you're able to get by because you earn an income. This is the combination. It's also a possibility. Then we come to basic income, and here it gets interesting because I'm not going to talk about one proposal, because in the movement for basic income, you see two broad camps. Of course, you can differentiate more between more proposals, but these are uh, more, more known ones that are clearly different from each other. So first of all, free market basic income. A famous proponent of this was Milton Friedman, and in terms of income, he specifically advocated for a negative income tax, which could be seen as a variation or a slight, slightly different proposal than a simple basic income. So that's clear on income. In terms of jobs, it's not so clear. So if people are able to get an income, if they don't have a job, then they can just through the market find their own job. So the government is not responsible for this. In terms of services, there is a very important difference also with the latter proposals, the social basic income, because it advocates that we basically should have no public services because people can get by through their basic income and in this way satisfy their basic needs. So in this idea, the free market will do the job. You will just make sure people have money so that they can cover their basic needs and that's all you need to do. Then the other part of the basic income proposal, or a different version of it, is that actually these public services should be there. So we shouldn't uh, break down the public services, whether it's healthcare or education that we have now, but we should let them be. But besides that, we should introduce a basic income so that people also have enough money. In terms of jobs, again, often it's also argued it's not a problem if people don't have a job. This is actually an argument for basic income. Because if people can do something that is really important and contributes something to society, but does not pay, then that's fine as well. In that way, unpaid labor is really being facilitated through this idea of a basic income. So those are three famous proposals. Shortly, some estimates that have been done on like how much money it would cost uh, to to pay for these proposals. For basic income in the European Union, the estimate is that it's roughly one quarter of GDP to pay for a basic income for its citizens. A job guarantee is significantly more uh, cheap. Um, it's estimated to cost around one or two percent of GDP. Uh, it's good to mention here that it's a very much uh, a proposal that, that is connected to how the economy is developing. So when the economy is on the downside. Of course, there is more spending because there are more people unemployed. So there is more, also more expenditures in terms of job guarantee, but perhaps also more money created through this. Um, and then when the economy goes well, of course, it becomes less. Um, for the extending public services uh, from not only healthcare and education, but also to include uh, childcare, public transportation, housing, and digital information is estimated to cost around 4% of GDP in the case of the uh, United Kingdom. A rough estimate of the order of how much it would cost. My personal uh, take on, on, on these different options is that a combination of a job guarantee together with public, extending public services could be a very promising combination in this case, as uh, the advocates of the job guarantee also suggest, there would be less use of the benefits 
because people are able to get a job. But as said, it's not about what I think tonight. That's about uh, what we are going to discuss on the panel. Um, but we are also interested in what, uh, in what you think of it. So I'll uh, give it uh, over to uh, Thomas again. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. So yes, we are, um, be before we, we are going to go to the panel, we're going to have a little questionnaire and ask everyone to vote um, on which kind of proposal they think would be the best. You can go to the website uh, menti.com and type in the code and then you can vote for uh, whichever option seems uh, best to you. I'm quite curious what, uh, what the people are thinking. But we're going to get that in. Let's just go to the panel yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and have, uh, have a discussion. So, but in the meanwhile, please uh, vote if, you, if you'd like to. I'm going to introduce um, our discussion panel. Um, first, we have uh, Andrew Percy, who's the director of the Universal Basic Services Network in the University College London. Uh, we have Mar Warren Mosler, who's a um, former banker, I believe, and one of the founders of M modern money theory. Um, and we have Louise Haag, who's a professor in the University of York, and she wrote a book, uh, The Case for a Universal Basic Income. Thank you for being here, all of you. Um, I'd like to start, give the word to, to uh, Andrew, and... I'd like, to, uh, um, I'd like you to answer the question of why we actually need this um, reform of our welfare system right now. Um, well, hi, Thomas. Hi, Sam. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I really like that uh, history introduction of um, the welfare state or the progression through the 20th century because it's, it's fairly well understood, right, that we had this progression where there was nothing and then in the sort of before the Second World War, we introduced various insurance schemes. Uh, and then after the Second World War in Europe, we, we developed a set of universal services. Um, and that progression, I think, is fairly well, well known. But what is I, I don't see so often is an understanding of why. Why did we do that? And I think the answer to that is not because we were kinder. It's because our economy demanded it. What happened was we moved from an industrial age into a technical and services age. And what that means is that the specialization in your population increases and it broadens. So you have a much wider range of the population that now needs uh, their uh, capacities and capabilities completed because they are specializing in something else. And they're also being paid for more than their time and their muscle, right? They're being paid for their brain. That means that uh, they have to bring them full selves to their work. And that requires then that a society invest in a whole bunch of additional services. So I think sometimes when we hear the word welfare, we tend to think too much of it as a sort of as a redistribution system or a means of being kind to someone. And I would argue that in order to understand this problem better, we need to understand that welfare, as we would call it, but these infrastructures in society are necessary to support advanced developed economies. Hmm. And that's why we have them. So what happened in the 20th century is we started to, to roll these out. And after the Second World War, we had tax rates go up into the sort of 40 percent, high, high 30s, 40 percent. And it, after that trajectory, somewhere in the 1980s, so for the Netherlands, 1987 was the peak allocation to collective resources at 42% of GDP. Pretty much every developed country has leveled off since then. So we've had 40 years of a debate and a conflict that can continue to rage. And it kind of goes like this, right? Which is, we want to have better services, but we can't raise any more money in taxes. And that is, I think we're stuck, right? So what, what possibly COVID has done is created an opportunity to break that lockdown. And maybe that's what your discussion is about, is to say, mm -hmm. hey, where are we going to go from here? Um, but I think it's important to understand the reasons why we have uh, that, what, you know, whether you call it a welfare system or I would call it an economic support system in place. Um, it's because the reason that we deliver those services is that we need every individual to step up, 
and can make their contribution. And if we're going to tackle the big challenges in front of us, whether that's climate change or any of these other ones, we're going to need as many people in our society. So some research has been done to show that 40% of the increase in productivity in America between the 60s and, uh, and 2010 came from the fact that a broader section of the population was enabled through education and those kind of support services to contribute at a higher level in the economy. Well, we need to ramp that up uh, uh, another uh, stage further. So I think this is the important thing, is to understand that the welfare system, to the extent that it creates safety, the purpose of that is a social purpose. It's the purpose is to create a bedrock for opportunity, hmm. for people to make their contribution. And I think one of the things I really like about your report is that you point to the importance of this reciprocal relationship. Right? Because that's kind of what gets, has been broken, I would say, for the last 40 years. Because as soon as you get to a point where you say, well, we can't raise any more taxes, and that's for a very good reason, because you would be intruding into the motivation of the people, and now we have broad specialization. So concerns about taxes is not just about some small rich portion. It's a general concern across society. And um, I think that that's a reasonable limit. And we then are, and for 40 years, we've basically been saying, we've been trying to make arguments about how, why we should increase taxation. And yet it hasn't happened. So I feel like we've got to a point where maybe that's the new discussion point from here. Let's assume we can't increase taxation. Now what do we do? Hmm. And I would argue that our economy continues to get more specialized. It's continually to get more technical. And that actually, if you want to grow, and there's a lot of talk about right, how we're going to grow out of this and mm. growth will lead to more uh, assets being available for these services. Um, but the reality of growth in a technical economy is more people need more services. You need more mm. education. You need more support. So I think that this is a really interesting turning point, and, mm. I, and I love that framing of the historical narrative, because I don't think this is correctly understood as uh, something about, you know, how do we, I, I think it's an economic narrative. Mm. Um, and Andrew, is yeah. there, so was there, were the services better like 40 years ago, and did we go down from that higher level? And is there something else behind that in our way of thinking that has caused this? So the services were built up, and uh, at services are infrastructure, so they take a while to run down. Uh, you know, I don't know that they were better or worse. I, you know, we allocated 40% of GDP then, and we allocate about the same now in Europe um, to these services. And so they haven't grown. There was a great report out of the London School of Economics in the UK um, looking at up to COVID, not since COVID, right? And and across the public services sector, they uh, they had a catalog of failures where we have not met those standards. Um, so I think that actually what we you know what what we need to turn to here is an understanding of what does it really mean to efficiently deliver the level of support that the economy needs. Um, and that's the way I would phrase this uh, argument is, is about creating efficiency out of it. And I think that's one of the big reasons that we're behind universal basic services is because of the efficiency. You know, there are both what we would call economies of scale and efficiencies of scale. So at the economies of scale level, if you make a national commitment to do this, like we do in the NHS healthcare, we manage to run our healthcare system with similar outcomes to the United States but for half the cost in GDP. We spend about 10% of GDP, they spend 20%. Outcomes are about the same. So that's a really good reason to do it at a high national level. Um, but the real efficiency comes from, and if you look at how we do our national health service, right, it's broken down into these hyper-local areas because the people who are running the healthcare system understand the specific population. Mm -hmm. So it's one something we're very keen about on universal basic services is that this, this idea that it's a commitment you make at a national level, you give people rights to access the basic safeties that they need, but the implementation has to be done at a local level, and that's where you get efficiencies in the cost. Mm -hmm. now, we have that, that is what I think is largely missing from you know European societies, which would be generally described at, you know closer to the universal basic services model um, than, uh, than than the rest of the world. I think what we're missing is this hyper local efficiency um, that that goes at a human scale. And the reason we don't have that typically is because we have, uh, for various historical reasons, we haven't had uh, great faith 
in local democracy. And I think one of the things that's, that stands out as a challenge uh, for developed societies is that, well, I can speak certainly for the UK and America, right, is we're, we're running on democratic systems and constitutions that were written hundreds of years ago in totally different times. And it, it, we need to catch up. So, you know, we, we have great 21st century opportunity. We're talking today about getting 21st century safety in place, but we don't have 21st century participation. Hmm. And until that's in place, I don't see that we're just going to be in an argument about do we decline for lack of opportunity or shall we decline for lack of safety? Hmm. Those are the choices in the political debate today. And who would get involved? Of course, people are turned off politics. That's not even a choice, right? So I, we, have to, we have to restore the reciprocity in the relationship. And I think that's substantially about uh, tax reform. We're working on a proposal. Basically, if you take 80% of UK spending, public spending, and uh, you look at the tax revenue uh, side of our, uh, where we get our money from, we get 80% of our money from taxes on individuals, mm. and we spend 80% of the cost is on public services mm. and social protection. But, Why and, not just announce that you're going to lock those two together? Mm. Everything you pay in, in, in insurance and social security is dedicated to social protection and um, mm. public services. And you would then create a direct relationship. Now there's a point in being a citizen. Don't call it a tax, call it a contribution, hmm. right? So have you paid your national contributions? Um, I think that's the kind of conversation we need to move to. That's not going to take us away from the fact that we need to be more efficient. I don't okay. believe that we should go into the future saying we're going to be able to raise 45%, 50%, 55% GDP hmm. in taxes. I just don't think it's there. Okay. Um, thank, and I know Warren will have thank, something to say yeah, about yeah. whether taxes th need to be raised at all. But we're going <laughs> to gonna have some more discussion on, on this later. But let's uh, introduce Warren and um, hear his introduction on, on what the job guarantee would actually do for us. So after uh, listening to this, let me start with a simple model, which is a historical fact as well. And uh, how many minutes would you like me to do this for? Let's, oh, take, five let, let's take five minutes, yeah. Okay. So uh, in the 1800s, the British went into uh, Africa, and they wanted to grow coffee. And the people living there didn't have any interest in growing coffee for the British. They were living their lives. They were a non-monetary society. They didn't have unemployment as we know it or anything like a, any kind of a monetary system. Uh, and so how did the British get the people out of their villages uh, into the coffee plantations? What they did was they imposed a tax, called it a hut tax. It was a tax on everybody's house, their huts. And, um, and I'll say there was a hut tax of uh, 10 crown a month. They just made up a tax. If you didn't pay the tax, the military was there to burn down your hut. So this is coercive taxation. But what happened? Okay, now all of a sudden people are saying, okay, we don't want our houses burned down. Uh, what do we have to do to get the money to pay the tax, the crown to pay the tax? Oh, well, you come down to the coffee plantation. We have jobs for you. Okay, so the, the hut tax created for the first time in Africa, unemployment, people looking for paid work, who couldn't find it, were directed down to the plantation to get the paid work they were seeking. So the tax liability in the first instance creates uh, unemployment. And one of the MMT contributions is the understanding that unemployment is created by tax liabilities by design. The British wanted to provision the coffee plantations. Mm -hmm. So people came down to the plantations, they worked. What was the wage? Well, it's a monopoly. They have the crown and the people need it. Are they going to get their houses burned down? They tell them, so it's an arithmetic problem. We'll pay one crown a day. That way they're going to get 10 days work out of each house. It's, it's just a calculation. Mm -hmm. But that becomes the wage in the society. And that becomes the numerary for value in the society, right? Because not everybody went down there. Some people would rather do something else. And uh, then maybe, maybe some people would work 30 days and make a lot more than they needed for their tax. And with the other 20 crown, they could buy things from people who didn't want to work in the coffee plantation. So that's... This society is immediately monetized almost on the first day. Hmm. Okay. They, they provided anybody who showed up at the coffee plantation was given a job doing something. That is the job guarantee. We'll hire anybody willing and able to work who wants to come down and do this job. People came down looking for work. Uh, they were paid. And then uh, they could go home. And then they would pay the tax when the tax liability was due. So here's the sequence. And MMT 
tells you the sequence which every MP has backwards. The sequence is not the government has to get money to be able to spend, okay, at all. The, the government is the source of the money to pay taxes. The British were the source of the crown to pay taxes. So this, the sequence is tax liability first, not tax collection, tax liability first. Then comes unemployment, then comes paid work by the government of issue, okay? Mm -hmm. Then comes the payment of the tax, and that ends the cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, the people worked for more than enough just to pay the tax, because they also wanted to save, uh, which you sort of have to do. You need money in your pocket, they needed, the merchants needed a uh, crown for, uh, to make change and to have cash for working capital and everything else. So the British wound up spending more than they collected. Okay, the total tax, if there was 100 houses, 10 each would be 1,000 crown a month. They might spend 1,500 crown because people wanted to come and work to earn crown for A, to pay the tax, and B, to net save in whatever form. Maybe they lost them in the wash. Maybe they gave them to their children or something like that. Put them aside in case they got sick and couldn't work. They didn't want to have their houses burned down. Uh, today, we have tax advantage pension fund contributions so people earn more than enough to pay the tax to uh, to uh, save exorbitant amounts and create this massive financial uh, sector that's is so, another rage I'll so, go into for you. So, so, okay, so what we have as a base case for analysis is a society with a job guarantee. Mm -hmm. That is the job guarantee. Now, what would happen if the British didn't want to hire everybody who showed up? Okay, well, then you don't have the job guarantee. Okay, now you've got something different. Now you've got unemployment. You have people looking for paid work who can't find it. Mm -hmm. And it, if it's for the amount they need to save, they can get by, but they still can't get it. Okay, if it's the amount they need to pay the tax, they're going to get their houses burned down. All right, and so it's all, unemployment is always the evidence that the British, in this case, did not spend enough to cover the need to pay taxes and the desire to save. Hmm. Okay, and that is end of story. So this is a separate and apart from any kind of welfare state concept, which is why I wanted to hmm. be behind to make that point. This is an imperative. So in the U.S. today, if but if we have, if we take this to to our modern society right now, and yes, the, the do government that. doesn't really burn houses down anymore, so that's a good thing. Um, but we do have a very complex. Uh, economy. Okay, where let, me, let me take it down to today. Private sector. The U.S. government has a tax structure in place. Mm -hmm. It creates 20 million unemployed. It only wants to hire 5 million, 3 million, 5 million. The other 15, 17 million are unemployed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it pays unemployment benefits. Well, why are they unemployed? Why? How did they get there? Because they were lazy? Because they didn't have enough skills? Because they didn't have training? No. It's because the spending was not enough to cover the need to pay taxes and the desire to save that was caused by the tax liability. The government's causing this by overtaxing for the size government we have. The solution is either to hire everybody who you cause to become unemployed or to lower taxes to send them back to the private sector, which doesn't necessarily work because of other institutional structure. But I've used up my five minutes, so. <laughs> but do you say that um, the, the companies in the private sector where that employ people right now, they're just doing what they're supposed to do, but it's the government who lets down this other part of, of our uh, uh, society where people don't have a job, they don't get hired by the private sector, so it's the government should take its role, take its responsibility, spend more, and then these people will, will, will have uh, a job yes. as well. Yeah, or, or tax less. You know, the problem is, though, once you've created unemployed people, I, as far as the private sector is concerned, they're damaged goods. They don't like to hire people that are unemployed. They prefer to hire people already working. Hmm. So instead of just leaving them as unemployed, we should have a job guarantee. So now they're working, they have an hmm. attendance record, they come in clean, they don't get in fights. These are things that the private sector likes before they, to see hmm. before they hire someone. Yeah. This facilitates the transition from unemployment, which is public sector. Remember, they've been taken from the private sector by the tax library. This transitions, this facilitates the transition from unemployment back to private sector employment. Hmm. So it's, it's part of this process. It's a, 
creation of government. Now, the other alternative is for the government to hire them into the public sector. If you presume the public sector is already fully provisioned, fine. I don't think it has. I think you can hire those people in more because of this starving, this lack of uh, uh, public sector services that we face, which is like, critical. But that's a political decision. Somebody else might say the public sector is already too large. We want to transition them back to the private sector. Yeah. Fine. Have a job guarantee. Get them in this. That will promote that transition. Hmm. Uh, other people might say, no, let's get them into it green jobs for public sector work, fine. Hire them as regular public sector people. Don't use the job guarantee to do regular public sector work. Okay. Now you're undermining the entire pay structure of the public sector by hiring cheap you know, labor that you created by the desperation of tax liabilities and insufficient spending. Don't use that as a lever to push public sector compensation down. That's not what progressive agenda is about hmm. at all. So if you want them in green jobs, don't fine, hire them out of this place to do whatever you want. If you want more lifeguards on the beach, fine. If you want more performance, fine, hire them. I'm all in favor of that, whatever serves public purpose. But, this, but the is, people in the job guarantee mm -hmm. are there to transition back to the private sector. And, and if, if they transition back to the private sector, so it's just a temporary um, uh, thing that job guarantee is yeah. the government now, will provide takes, jobs if, whenever if they there's don't transition, no. They don't transition. We, we tried. OK. And, and we can take it from there if they don't. But it's not the primary purpose. It's not to keep them in the job guarantee to perform public sector work. Use. You know, I see too many MMT proponents will start an interview and somebody will say, well, what are all these people going to do in the job guarantee? They say, oh, there's all kinds of useful work. Wrong answer. <laughs> if there's all kinds of useful work, the government should hire people to do those all kinds of useful work if it knows. And when they come up with all these great jobs these people can do, just hire them at normal public pay scale, $60,000, $80,000 a year, not $15 an hour subsistence job guarantee. That's not what, that's not what it's about. I, start, I wrote this up in 1992, I think, okay, so I'm not new to this. And it's a consequence of understanding the monetary operations behind it that mm. would compel you to do this, it lowers, it's a, the job guarantee, because of what I just said, is a better price anchor than using unemployment. Right mm. now, we leave a lot of unemployed because we want labor to be, you know, cheap so that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to stop wage inflation. When mm. unemployment gets too low, oh, that's inflationary. The neighbor is too low. No. We've got to take issue to increase. So we're using this unemployment created by the government as a buffer stock for price stability. Okay, uh, thanks, Warren. Buffer stock is a superior way to do it because they will go back to the private sector to prevent the wage inflation. Let's let's move to uh, Louise. Yeah. And yeah. Um, hi, Louise. Hello. I saw you um, disagreeing sometimes because I could see you on the screen when Sam was giving his presentation. So, I have a very impressive face. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, but but I I found that interesting. So, it, can you 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 wrote a book, the case for a, a UBI, a universal basic income. Um, can you explain a little bit of how you uh, see a universal basic income and uh, what what things you disagree with uh, that that Sam just mentioned? I, I well. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I think this is a very interesting debate. Uh, and I think we really should be debating how the ideas connect uh, with each other. And, mm. I, and I hope we get a chance to do that. Um, well, the reason, the reason I perhaps reacted is that I felt uh, it was the caricature version of basic income, no? That uh, you put on, on, this, on the slide. Uh, and it sort of represents the polemic around the, the concept, which, um, I think it's understandable because it has been very polemicized. But if you read my book or any of my other writings, you'll know that I advocated for universal basic income from a completely different perspective. Um, I see it as part of a new social democracy. And I see it as one institutional change amongst many other necessary institutional changes to innovate the welfare state. Mm. And I think um, probably, I don't agree with everything Andrew said, uh, but I think um, what the proponents of universal basic services are saying now is very much in line with what I've been writing for you know a very long time, which is that we need uh, to combine three things, really. Uh, we need to combine a renewed investment in public services. Although I prefer a public ownership model to just a subsidy model, 
in terms of subsidizing groups that, that can't afford um, services. I, I prefer that we move in a direction of a more of a public ownership model. Uh, and I think the Scandinavian countries uh, uh, are an example um, that we can look at. Um, secondly, we need a multi-tiered, a composite uh, system of economic security, the, the floor of which ought to, to be guaranteed. Okay, so, and I, and I believe the reason I advocate for basic income is I think we've gotten ourselves stuck. Uh, here I agree with uh, Andrew. We've got ourselves stuck and we, we got ourselves deep and deep in the mud in the last 40 years uh, on a model um, which sanctions people for being poor and, uh, and working precarious jobs. And it's morally indefensible uh, and it's uh, irrational. It demotivates, it does the opposite of what we want to do. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I think ideally a universal basic income should be universal. There should be uh, a, a baseline that is shared just as there is a baseline that is shared in terms of services. Um, to which then we can we can add. Uh, I, I don't. I completely dispute your figure of 25% um, cost of universal basic income, because it really depends on the level. It depends what you calculate in in terms of what is converted into paying for the basic minimum. Um, but I'm not adverse to thinking about um, a form of progression into this uh, state of affairs where we can all share. A, a subsistence minimum that is paid out as a subsistence grant, whereby we guarantee a minimum that is means tested. Perhaps that is the way we need to start. Mm. My concern has, is that if we don't explain properly why we're doing this, we may come back, we may revert to the um, sanctions based policies and the conditionalities and the checks on the poor, which is what always happens when we fail to explain why it is everyone is in fact entitled. Um, to subsistence. But I mean, I don't think that a basic income is the only thing we need. I don't think basic income should be talked about in terms of um, making people responsible individually for um, consuming services or paying for uh, housing or uh, and so on through the basic income grant. I think the basic income grant is part of a package of measures, many of which ought to include provided services. And so, you know, I really, I really don't think we disagree as much as it has been made out. And the third uh, thing that I advocate for in this context is for a new uh, species of employment promotion, which is around recreating occupational, uh, uh, occupational streams as we used to have in the post-war uh, period with greater investment into apprenticeships and um, a form of public sector jobs that are properly occupational. And I think this is partly to do with how the money is spent. It's not necessarily where you're spending more, but thinking about how the money is spent and how the jobs are organized. Uh, so do we rely on hiring people in, um, as Warren was talking about, um, or do we try to build actual um, well-staffed, stable, stable occupationally staffed services? Um, and we know the, in the United Kingdom, we have a lack of nurses as 50,000, this is the latest figure from the Health Foundation, uh, nurses that we're going to need between now and 2024. Um, and so when we think about what, how should we put the systems together, I think the best way to incentivize uh, people is not to compel people to do, um, take any job, but to offer opportunities that are realistic and attractive together with guaranteeing people's basic needs. Mm. And, and, and these things uh, belong together. Uh, I think it's about the institutional redesign. The problem we have, and I don't think people are really aware of it, is that as the income support system works now, one in four people are sanctioned every year and are at risk of losing benefits. I mean, in principle, it's not defensible to say, I believe, and we have made a commitment to human life, that we're prepared to see people starve uh, or accept that, as we now know, people become mentally ill or they have a very high rate of suicide, the people facing the prospect of losing all of their subsistence, all of their subsistence. At the moment, we guarantee this much, zero. Your benefits can be taken away completely, okay? 
And, and we have cases, some really morally problematic cases of people because of the way we designed the benefit system, specifically in a punitive direction, to make it difficult for people because we do not trust that people are, are honest, mm. um, that we put them in situations where potentially they, 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 they cannot uh, eat and we have people who have killed themselves. There are some very notorious cases that have been impressed, but there are many, many more cases. Uh, and, and it frightens me that we are not aware of, of what is actually going on and we are not morally outraged at what's going on. Um, so I, I support a basic income because I think it's very important that there are institutions in society that are constitutive of citizenship, the sense in which we belong to a society where we care about each other. Now, um, Andrew made, I think, a very interesting uh, historical observation as well, and building on your presentation, I agree, it's very good to take a historical uh, perspective on things. But I think, as Andrew also said, you're focusing on the UK and to a certain extent the US, but of course, welfare states are very different. And the foundations for the welfare state and the rationale for which people pay tax and, and, and what they accept as a rationale, whatever you want to call it, is different. I mean, I, I call tax sharing risk. I don't, you know, so this is maybe my difference with Warren. I th and, and I think if we look at the Nordic welfare states, how do we, how do we explain how their spending increased so massively after the war? Uh, and we're looking at 50% of GDP, not 40. Uh, how come the Nordic states spend 7 or 8% on education and are, and are able uh, to support their students without fees right through university and with the grants? And how come we have 30% of young people going into apprenticeships? Um, and so on and so forth. And we spend, uh, depending on the year, we'll get 20 times more than the UK does on training. Okay. Um, and we have economic security systems that build on contributions that are occupationally based, therefore alleviates the number of people who go on the lowest benefits, mm. all of which I support. That's why I think you, a basic income is, should be set within this sort of model. Why we have that is because we agree to cooperate to guarantee each other's security. And that if we... It, welfare state is. If, and if, that, that is our security in employment, it is yeah. our security in services, and it's our security in income. And it has many components. And, what, you know, the Louise, only thing I react to, just one more thing, in okay. your model, when you said limited services, that the post-war post model was limited services, well, that depends on the state you look at, no? I mean, the Nordic states in the 60s and 70s vastly expanded their public services. So uh, childcare services uh, were made very cheap and, and available to all, and they still are heavily subsidized, care services are occupationally based, uh, stable jobs. They're not here, it's not like in the UK where the most vulnerable workers look after the most vulnerable people, hmm. you know. So, you know, these are institutional choices, they're normative choices. Um, and for me, basic income fits in this wider picture of shared security. It is not an individualistic, from my perspective, it is the opposite of an individualistic hmm. economy. It's and, part of cooperative economy. And what is what is the distinctive thing that a universal basic income will add? Because if we just take the the uh, basic services, if we expand that, um, make sure we have have more services, um, but then still you would add a universal basic income on, on top of that. Because well, uh, but, I mean, because we, if we can are, it, we it are cannot money let, let me make one one more thing. Because um, you were talking about how you can. Um, for example, uh, uh, solve the problems with people who are on social benefits, but still a universal basic income will not be enough for those people with disabilities or, or uh, the people in need. Um, so do you actually well, solve that problem or what, what is the addition of, of the universal basic income? Well, I don't see universal basic income as replacing the welfare state with a low flat benefit. Okay, mm -hmm. I see universal basic income as the foundation for a building. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it is an unconditional low, lower tier in the welfare state. The better we build our shared security systems, the higher it may become. But of course, we are going to, we should give more uh, um, services and more money f for people who need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I've... I've uh we only have, have 10 more minutes left, so we're going to uh, fast forward to the, the, the current situation where we actually are in, in the pandemic. 
our governments are spending a lot of uh, uh, money. And um, we are in a situation where we already uh, have, have a different view on, on uh, the monetary uh, uh, options that we have. But there's also a risk of uh, our ministers of finance going back to the old narrative, uh, saying that we have to go to another period of austerity, we have to pay back all this government debt. Um, so how are we going to... Uh, avoid that situation and what would be the way forward? And Andrew, can you reply on, on uh, this question? Yeah, so I, I mean, we are definitely in a place where, you know, there are people who point to last year as saying, you know, that we are tiptoeing into areas of basic income and modern monetary uh, kind of theory. Now, I'm sure the advocates of both of those would, would disagree. But uh, undoubtedly, we've had unprecedented spending. We are at a point now where uh, developed countries, I'll speak for the UK, we have the highest level of public debt that we've ever had in peacetime. And um, I, I think that while, uh, you know, there is, um, you know, a lot of... Here's what I worry. I, I, I think that... Um, we can be cleverer than, uh, than is useful or safe. I think that we can come up with models that say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know on, on the one level, you could advocate for 30, 100-year bonds, let's say. We're just gonna, never going to pay this money back, basically, or not in this generation, maybe in two generations, after we've dealt with climate change and everything else. And so you, you extend the horizon. Or you take a pure LMT position and you say, well, we don't, you don't need to counter this in taxes. Uh, uh, you know, as Warren said, it has a different relationship. Um, so if there's, uh, you know, basically capacity in the economy, you should fill it. And the, then, then the, your counter narrative, like how do we stop politicians going back to um, uh, old narratives? And I think, you know, what's, what's difficult about that is I, I think that, um, you know, and I'm not alone in saying that I think that there is a case to be made that the kind of rise of populism in political, the, 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 the anger that you see for a lot of people um, about the way the world is working. And high, high, we're not talking about uh, advanced societies having high levels of satisfaction um, with the way things are going or where they look like they're going for people's children. Uh, these are things that score very lowly uh, in, in responses. I think that we can't ignore the fact that um, you know, if one person is going to get thrown out of their house because they don't pay their mortgage, that you cannot then have a parallel system at another level in society that's very clever and you've done the models and you, you can sort of, you know, demonstrate to an intellectual coffeehouse crowd that your model stands up. If you can't explain this to someone else who is living in an economy and a place where money means a real thing, Mm. And if they borrow it, they have to pay it back. And if they don't, they lose their house, or they get their legs broken or something else. And if that's not true for everybody else too, as well, mm. then you, have, you don't have an economic problem. You can make the justification, oh, there'll be no inflation. We can you know, put this on long bonds. We don't have to pay it back. This is all technical justification. Mm. Where, that floor, where, where the floor is, is the social premise. Mm. Like, is that a basis on which you believe you can, ex you can have solidarity in your society. And I would say that's the fire that you're playing with with this mm -hmm. stuff. It's too clever by half. Too many, too many economists with too big a spreadsheet uh, uh, coming up with a justification. So we can, I, I agree with what you're saying, which is, you know, and I, I think frankly, the chances are our politicians will take us back to austerity because they don't have an alternative narrative. And this is exactly the hiatus we've been stuck in for 40 years. Mm -hmm. We can't raise taxes. And we can't do safety any more efficiently than we have. Therefore, we have to have less safety. Hmm. That, and, that, and no change. Um, so, <laughs> but the change is the change that we need. I think is to look at how we do safety in a way. It's not to pretend that money is some clever instrument. I mean, you know, it's dangerous enough. Everybody already knows it's just ones and zeros in a bank, right? And <laughs> and it's not real. So, it, you know. I think we have to be very careful with that concept and not for economic reasons, not for financial reasons, but for social and political reasons. Mm. On the other hand, if we have politicians who um, have discovered that they can actually uh, spend more money 
um, than they thought they could. Um, how are we going to make sure that we do have the jobs that we actually require? Because, for example, here in the Netherlands, we are moving towards a, a testing society. We spend 1.1 billion on tests if you want to go into a bar. And there's a lot of debate whether that is the right um, uh, purpose for this money. So uh, shouldn't we be afraid, on the other hand, of, of uh, politicians uh, taking too much on their hands and, and spending a lot of money on, on things that the people actually don't want? Warren, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, oh, that you always have to be wary of that. That's been going on since the beginning of time. And that's why we need transparency. We need to have accountability of all the politicians and what they're doing. So um, let me do one thing very quickly, go back to Africa. The tax is 1,000 crown a month, 10 on each house. And people show up for work and earn 1,500 crown. Take them home. 1,000 are used to pay the tax. The other 500 are savings. They're in the street. Okay, That 500 is the public debt. It's the crown that was spent that have not yet used pay taxes. Hmm. The British government spends so many pounds, I don't even know what the budget is this year. Some get used to pay taxes. Remember the sequence, right? Hmm. Tax liability first, then spending. But that's okay, the situation so we are in right now. Eh? We have a lot right of now, savings on first, our bands. You spend first, some of that gets and that credits accounts. I'll be technical. You know, you get numbers in your bank account. Some of that is used to pay taxes. Your numbers go down and the rest stays in your bank account. And that is the public debt. The public mm -hmm. debt are the pounds spent by the British government that have not yet been used to pay taxes. They're sitting in your bank account, and now you have the option to shift them to a different bank account that they call GILTS. GILTS is just a bank account at the Bank of England. It's like a savings account. You give it money, and it comes back with interest. So you have checking accounts and savings accounts. You have reserve accounts and GILTS. They're just, you know, in bonds or whatever you want to call them. They're just fancy names for the same thing. Yeah. Checking accounts and savings accounts or time deposits, whatever you want to call them. Okay, so the public debt are the pounds spent that have not been yet been used to pay taxes. Some get used to pay taxes, the rest sit in bank accounts as the money supply in the economy. It's the net money supply, the bottom line money supply in the economy. The public debt is the money supply in the economy. The 500 crown in the street in Africa is the money supply in that economy. It's in people's pockets, it's in merchants' cash registers, wherever it is. The public debt is your money supply. Does anybody say, let's pay off the money supply? It already is the money. What are you going to pay it off? You're going to give them two fives yeah. or ten or something? It's, it's, it's already the money. Warren, what do you, what do you say to the, what do you say to the, Warren, that, that one of the points that's raised is that the number of countries in the world that could operate this kind of system is, is possibly down to one, which would be the United States of America, because no, everybody every, else has yeah. currency liabilities uh, no, every, uh, through, through exchange. No, everybody Without else is, look, every country in the world almost is running a budget deficit. It's not just the United States. Japan's is more than double the US, you know, the Euro, Collectively, the zone is more than much higher than the U.S. The U.K. is probably about the same. Uh, it all depends on the desire to save. People working to earn money, some gets used to pay taxes and the rest gets saved. That limits what the government can purchase. The tax liability. But isn't, isn't there a currency? Isn't there a currency credibility issue for, no. for for smaller countries? No, these are tax credits. They have value because they're needed to pay tax, and they create a residual desire to save them. For security reasons, and that's it. It's the same anywhere. I've created three currencies at universities to do student community service that have existed UMKC for over twenty for twenty five years. You know, it, this has got nothing that if it had anything to do with faith or anything like that, these currencies would have been gone a long time ago. I've seen faith go negative in almost every country in the world, and the currency is still there. The U.S. during the uh, debt ceiling crisis and the euro crisis, and the U.K. has had some horrendous crises. Okay. It goes if, on because it's a tax credit. If we you look, need it to pay the tax, or you lose your house or your car. Okay, if, if we if we look at the yeah. current uh, Warren, if we look at the current situation, and I would like to Louise to to react to that. Um, there is a lot can of. I, can I add? Can I add fifteen more seconds? <laughs> no, so we, we have to. We have to move on. We're really okay. past time. Okay. Uh, um, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of people right now have 
a lot of savings on their bank, bank account, actually, because um, they got their salaries pay, paid and they couldn't spend it because all uh, bars, restaurants and, and, and shops were closed. But it's, it's unevenly divided. Some people have a lot of savings and there's still a lot of people that don't have a lot of savings, especially because the, the KLM pilots who were sitting at home still received 9,000 euros a month, while the people who were on social benefits just got a thousand euros a month. So it's it's uh, quite a big difference. So how how can we move forward on this on this point, uh, Louise, to make sure that your idea of of the basic universal income is actually something um, which will um, be implemented after this period, and um, that we don't move back to to uh, the same system. I think they're slightly separate problems. I, um, but I, th I think I, I think I agree with Andrew. I mean, we we need to move the monetary system closer to the real economy, not further away from it. And and I'm slightly worried um, about um, you know centralizing or globalizing a system. Any sort of globalization of the system of money has not taken in the wrong direction. I mean, we need obviously. Um, a global financial system, but we need one that's far more regulated and we need more national control of money. Uh, you know, people are leaving the EU because the EU went too far in trying to control national sovereignty in very different real economies. And so mm. we had crises in the south of Europe who do, where they have, uh, where they do things uh, differently, where their labor market systems are different and so on and so forth. And they can't follow the austerity model, balanced budget model of Germany. Yeah. And so even within Europe, which is, you know, doing many things, mm. the other things right, you know, we have a prob problem when you try to hamstrung individual countries to other countries, monetary uh, and real economies. So, you know, we need more decentralization of monetary systems, if anything, and more and, and, and closer attachment to the real economy. But I'm, I, I, I wanted to come back um, to some other things that were said earlier. So it uh, got slightly... Um, lost there. Well, when we were talking about what the welfare state is and w what the rationale for, for what we're wanting to do is. And I think we need to think more in terms of mutual societies. I mean, one of the, I think, uh, mutual societies as in co-investment for uh, goods in society. And one of the problems you have in the United Kingdom, I think, in relation to the benefit system is for the housing benefits have become so expensive because governments over several decades made the decision to privatize um, uh, housing costs in the sense that most or a lot of the in uh, benefits that are now paid through the uh, housing benefit are uh, for private rentals and they're very expensive. And so th this comes back to the coherence and the importance of linking a, a new approach to public services and, and, and a new approach to the benefit system, because I think we have a real problem um, with public ownership in the UK in particular, where it's a concept that is sort of not sufficiently well understood. And we need to go back to more of a regulatory approach and a public ownership approach to basic goods. Here I agree with uh, what I think the universal basic services mm. model uh, is aiming at. Um, and we have some very inequitable and very inequitable situation now, which, which makes me also be slightly suspicious of the idea that we should decentralize everything. So we're trying to, uh, the UK is trying to expand its house building, building a capacity or program in order to um, burst the housing bubble and make it less expensive uh, for everyone, both those who, who need housing support and those who don't, to afford housing. Uh, so less expensive for the public and less expensive for private individuals. Mm. And, and we're finding a, a real difficulty with uh, even a basic model of sharing out between the regions, how many public houses each region should be taking or should be building. And, and it's, you know, the, the richer uh, counties uh, with um, rolling hills and beautiful landscapes do not want houses there. And so, you know, we still have these massive regional inequalities and you actually, you need to combine, whilst I agree with, you, you need a local participatory approach, but you also need uh, a national approach, a redistributive approach in, in terms of uh, how, do you, how do you build up public goods? Uh, and I think not, the subsidy model has really run its course, right? Uh, and okay, th thank you, thank you Lu Louise. We, we have to, we have to um, close. 
uh, and move to the end because our time's up and there's a, a next session going on after this one uh, about the Dutch social security uh, system and it's in uh, Dutch language for the people who want to stay and, and watch that as well. Um, I'd like to move to, to the survey of, of uh, our audience of uh, which option is the most popular one. Um, okay, so it's the basic income, yes. Okay, most popular people just want money on the bank accounts. And the smart policy com combination, okay. That's uh, a combination of all the options. So let's see what the f future will bring. Uh, thank you very much for watching and if you want, stay on this channel. Thanks. <laughs>